Hey, all you Boxer 2 valve riders out there. I um, want to just say thanks for all the great comments you've made about the video series so far. And I know there's been a really long gap since the last video came out. We're really excited to be back at it again. I got some interesting news to tell you about why we were so delayed, and it was simply a matter of this. Well, first of all, we moved from California to North Carolina, which in itself was quite an undertaking. In fact, it took four semi trailers to get our, our bikes and all our stuff over here, but we did it and it was um, quite, a, quite a, a move, but absolutely worth every minute. It's awesome here. The other thing that happened was that we unfortunately got bit by one of those terrible ransomware viruses and it encrypted files on our hard drive, on a hard drive that contained some of the unedited videos that we had done with this bike project. We were really scared. We thought that they were gone forever, but luckily a decryption tool came out and we were able to safely decrypt all those files. And so Jeff's been real busy editing all those videos that we took back in California. And those are the ones that you're going to see right now following this in a two part series. And that moves us farther along in the process. Now the bike's here in North Carolina and we're going to finish it up. We've got a few more videos to go, but first enjoy the videos that we shot back in California and if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll find that you'll be seeing a lot more videos coming out from us on a more frequent basis. If we're going to be finishing up this project with the R90-6, we've already got plans for our next series of video that's going to be revolving around a monolever R80RT. More about that later. In the meantime, enjoy these videos we shot in California and in the near future, you'll be seeing the continuation of the videos being shot here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. <clears throat> Hi and welcome back. We're cruising along trying to get this R90-6 back on the road and now that the front end is pretty much all assembled we need uh, front wheels, the front wheel, front wheel bearings and brakes, very important. So a couple videos ago uh, we pulled this master cylinder off to kind of see what was up with it. It was really rusty and, and so on and when I got this piston out of there it's all rusty and a lot of junk caked on there. I kind of thought the worst for this master cylinder. However, uh, a few passes with a flex hone and actually cleaned up really nicely. And we offer the rebuild kits, uh, original ATE rebuild kits that come with the new piston, new seals and new circlip and everything. It's pretty straightforward to install, just goes back together the same way it came apart. While I was at it, I blasted all the rust off and painted it and got pretty high hopes that this thing's going to work out okay, uh, much to my surprise. But we'll get to that in just a bit when we reinstall it on the bike. What I'm going to do right now in preparation for all of this is go through this ATE brake caliper. Now these are not the most effective brakes ever on any motorcycle. Anybody who has one of these you'll know but uh, ah, they, they work. We're gonna try to make it work as best we possibly can. So there are two sizes of these. There's a 38 millimeter and a 40 millimeter. And typically, if you don't see a stamping on there, that'll mean it's a 38, because the 40s came a little bit later. Um, so I believe that to be what we have here. So let's uh, take this thing apart. So I've cleaned it up a little bit in the solvent tank, and I have also removed the brake line, so it's just the caliper. Now, a way to, one way to get this out is with compressed air. Actually, we're going to give that, that, that technique a try here. So you're going to want to use something like this, like a piece of plywood because when you introduce air into here, the piston is under a tremendous amount of pressure and it'll become a projectile and you could do yourself or somebody else or something great damage. So I'm just holding this plywood in there like that. And now let's see if we can get some pressure in there. You can see the piston coming out like that. And now that the piston's out that far, you can get a good bite on it and just pull it out the rest of the way.
Yeah, so I just went and, and uh, dumped out the brake fluid that was in there. And uh, that's that. So here's the piston. Other than being a little bit dirty, it's not in too bad a shape and it could conceivably be reused. But I think I'm going to go ahead and change it out anyway. We have these rebuild kits here. And this comes with a new dust seal, a new piston seal, and a new piston as well. Nice reproduction piece. So getting back to this, the dust seal needs to be removed. Just a very light fit in there, comes out easily. Then the rubber seal, it's like a, a square O-ring, comes out. And I'm going to just thoroughly clean this cavity here. Take a little bit of time to make sure it's nice and clean. And then just as a good measure, I'm going to clean that out with some brake parts cleaner too. So here's my new parts here. And what I'm going to do, I put some gloves on because I'm going to lubricate things with some brake fluid. And don't really want to get that on my skin too much. So, so I'm going to put a little bit of brake fluid inside the caliper and on the piston. Before you put the seal in, go ahead and, and test fit the, the piston. And the reason for that is, is just so you kind of feel what's going on. It's a very, very, very precise fit. And even without the seal installed, it can be almost a little bit hard to get the piston in. So just so you kind of know what you're up against, Go ahead and set that in there, and you'll actually feel that it, you have to kind of rock it to get it to go in all, all the way. Even without the seal in there, there's a little bit of an edge where that seal, uh, there's a little bit of an edge where, that's, that, where the piston can hang up on. So, you, so having felt that helps you a lot with the actual assembly. All right, so now, now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and put the, the seal ring in. and give that a little bit more brake fluid, lube it up a bit. As well as the piston. Okay, so now we kind of know what we're up against. We gotta very carefully get everything lined up. Oh, and by the way, you can see that the piston has a really nice uh, chamfer on it, but you have to, it has to kind of get over that edge. So it'll, it just takes a little bit of finesse to get it in there. Just like that. Just don't give up. Okay. 
And now the dust seal goes in. For the purpose of putting that in, I'm just going to pull the piston out just a little bit, like so, and go ahead and introduce the dust seal. Like that. Now I can go ahead and press it all in and push this dust seal into place. Because the opening here is uh, smaller than the outer diameter of the seal. It's a little tough to get um, a, a seal driver or anything like that in there. So just, it's not a very tight fit. You can just push it around until you get it all the way seated in there very carefully. So now, now we've got this component also ready to put on the bike. So I'm with we're, gonna, we're just going to set that aside for right now and go on to some other little things we need to do to prepare for reassembly of all these components. Previously, you may recall, I, we took the steering damper out and I wanted to actually put the steering damper in, but I determined that this ball was uh, loose on there. So what I did was I went ahead and just welded that. This is all steel, so I just zapped it with the wire feed and then uh, took the high spots off with a little half inch belt sander. Worked out pretty good. I think it'll be fine. So now we can get back to this steering damper mechanism that we took apart quite some time ago. And it's really pretty simple. This fits in like so. And when you turn this pinion, then, whoops, I'm sorry, it goes this way. When you turn the pinion, basically you're changing it from center position, which is not going to have any influence at all, to a position about like that, which is going to move the damper a little bit, and all the way it's going to move it more. Basically a matter of uh, mechanical advantage based on the angle. So it's just a matter of taking this apart, assuming you don't have to make that repair. Um, when you have it apart, just clean it really thoroughly, put some grease in there, put it back together, good to go. All right, so just gonna kind of lube this up a little bit. Here again, my favorite grease, LM47. And I'm just gonna put a little smear in here. And on the sides too. And then these little Guys get pushed back in, a little spring. Nothing to it. And that's the steering damping mechanism. Now there is also a little rubber seal that goes on here, but this is it was missing on this bike. <clears throat> I don't have one. It's not gonna slow us down though. We'll come back and put that in later. It's not a real big deal, but it should go there anyway. Okay, so that's that one. All right, now we're going to get started on the wheel. I went ahead and put a new tire and tube on there. And now we're going to look at the brake disc and wheel bearings. Now this bike, as we found in so many cases, is kind of a bit of mix up match parts. This is actually not the correct brake disc for this model year. This is uh, the solid disc, which goes up to 974. This is a 75 model. So anyway, we're going to put the correct brake disc on there. But I want to show you that we have these really awesome brake discs from Siebenrock. We keep these all in stock. I'll go through them one at a time. These are really super top quality. They're made in Germany exclusively for Siebenrock by Magura. And as you can see here, the casting, it's like exactly perfect. It's just like spot on. You can see the little Magura emblem there, made by Siebenrock. So this is up to 974. And then after that, they went to a three two hole pattern. This is the disc that we're gonna put on this bike. This is the correct disc for this bike. Same beautiful carrier. Super top quality in stock. And then we have from, from 78 all the way up to 84, the two two-hole pattern. Still 
super, super top quality. And a variation on that one is the, the deep dish uh, disc, disc, which was used on, for example, the RDG slash S and the ST. So we carry all these ready for immediate shipment. And these are really going to improve the way your brakes perform, because not only are they a beautiful reproduction, but they're using really top quality materials that uh, just simply work uh, to improve, make the brakes as good as they can be on your, on your bike. So let's get down to business here. On these older models, you've got these special threaded on nuts. And to get those off, this is a great tool. This is a pin wrench, and it also has the smaller pins if you have any pre-69 models, that, that this will work on that too. Now it's a little tough to get a good bite on that, so the first thing I'm gonna do is remove the brake disc so I can get that out. It has to come off anyway. Now with the brake disc off, the tool fits nicely into those pins and then you can just unscrew the nut. And these bearings are pretty dry, so it's a good thing we're going in here. So with something like this, it's always a good idea to replace the wheel bearings, but you could just take them apart and grease them. It's something that's a good idea to do, even if the bearings are in good shape. These do kind of show some wear, but <clears throat> irregardless, even if they were perfect, I still want to replace them so we can kind of go through the procedure of doing that. It's pretty difficult to get the outer wheel bearing races out really cleanly, um, unless you have the right tool. And this is the Kuko Puller. It's a really awesome tool made in Germany. And this is something that we carry. And it's really, if you're going to be working on your, your old airhead and doing some of the important uh, repairs, you kind of need one of these. And the, there are different pullers. The, this, these just screw in. And this is the right one for the wheel bearings. Also works on the swing arm bearings, um, bikes up to 84. And then there's the different attachments that are available. For example, this one's for the the uh, steering head bearings on all models. This is, this is for the uh, sealed wheel bearings and this is for the swing arm bearings on 81 and later models. So you don't necessarily need them all, but just the ones that you need. But in any case, the bridge is the, the key part to it. This is the or a counter stay, as it's also called. And so I'm going to drop that right in here, tighten this nut up a little bit. And what that does is it brings this wedge up in between the two puller halves and expands it. And then we're just going to adjust this down. And we just get this all sort of centered up here and adjust this nut down. If you can now at this point, I can feel it's under tension. And now using a 32 millimeter wrench, I'm just going to tighten this nut here and hold the shaft st steady and it'll just pull the bearing right out. There we go. Super clean extraction, no pounding, no distress to any part of, of the wheel. I'll flip it over and do the other side. Okay, I'm just going to clean out 
all the old grease here. There's not much of it, it's pretty dry. But get this all cleaned up. So now we got the new wheel bearings here. These are super top quality bearings that we recommend. And by the way, these are the same bearings that also fit the swing arm up to 1980. Let's take those out of the package here. To install the outer races, we've got something like this. This is just a real simple bearing driver set from Harbor Freight. Works great, inexpensive, and just find the right one. This one's the one here. These things come in handy for, for a, lot of, a lot of applications. Okay, so we're just gonna make sure everything's nice and clean here. All the remnants of grease are gone. And we're just gonna tap this bearing into place. That's the sound we're looking for. You can hear that solid sound that you know the bearing's in all the way. So before we put any grease on the bearings, we're going to test fit everything dry and make sure, and that's the best way to, to check for uh, proper bearing preload. And once that's done, then we'll go ahead and grease the bearings and reassemble everything. What came out of here is um, the spacer sleeve and also a shim. And the, the combined length of these two is what uh, allows you to adjust the, the uh, preload on the bearing. These are tapered roller bearings. They need to have a little bit of preload on there. Not too much, but definitely no play. There's, they need to be under a little bit of preload. And the way you can achieve that is by changing out or, or cutting or sanding these uh, shims or, uh, and to find the right thickness. Now that the outer bearing races are installed, now we're going to go about setting the bearing preload. And to do that, basically you do this. Take the dry, clean bearing onto the axle. Sit that through like so, and then this sleeve. And then we're going to start with this spacer here, which is what came out. And then put the other bearing in like that. Okay, now you're going to need some kind of a spacer so you can put the nut on there. And so this is a real easy thing to make, just a piece of tubing. In this case, what I did was I took one of those cheesy spark plug saw because I think it came with my lawnmower or something like that. So I know it's like some reasonably good grade of steel, but I just cut it off on the bandsaw and then just touched it up and deburred it on the lathe so that the most important thing is that the two surfaces are totally parallel. So if you don't have a lathe, um, you can just work it and just measure all the way around so you get even parallel surfaces. That's pretty important for this. But that tool is actually pretty cool because it actually has the holes pre-drilled, so when I'm done with this, I can just hang it up on the pegboard. It's a good place to store it. So now that that's all set up, put the sleeve on there, or the tubing, and just put the nut on. And sort of center, center that up as best you can by eye. And I can already feel this one's going to be too tight, but nonetheless, let's go through, just start to snug this down. And yeah, just with even the most slight amount of tension, the bearing's stiff. So that's definitely not the right size. This adjustment um, shim is too small. We need to put a thicker one in, which is going to bring the bearings farther apart from each other. That's really what's going on. So we're going to just get that one out of there and put this one in instead. This one's quite the opposite. 
This one's too loose. I can, there's noticeable play. Well, very small, but still it's noticeable. You can basically even maybe hear it. So that's that. This one isn't going to work either. This one's too big. The bearings are too far apart. We need something to split the difference. So you can get kind of scientific about it too. We know that these two shims that I just tried are the wrong ones. So I'm going to mic this one. And that's at about 7.1 millimeters. About 6.5 millimeters. And this one here should be somewhere right about in the middle. It's about 6.95. And I've already determined that this one's pretty close, but it's still going to need a little bit of working. Let's put that in there to, just to see. Okay, so with this one, I would say it has, there's an absence of play. There's no play, but there's also no preload. So we need to take a little bit off of this one to get it to work just perfectly. So if you watched the other video where we did the rear wheel bearings, it was a totally different procedure where we, we were looking for um, the outer sleeve movement and tension. And unfortunately on these front wheel bearings for the disc brake models, there's no better way. It's a little bit of feeling and a lot of trial and error, uh, but uh, it's doable nonetheless. So with this one here, which we marked out, I marked it out before, at 6.95. I'm going to just take, take this down a little bit at a time until I get the, the clearance that I'm looking for. So I just have a basically a good piece of uh, emery paper here and I'm going to sand on that and keep rotating it. Don't just sand it in one direction. And you can do both sides. Apply even pressure, and then periodically take a measurement and see what effect that had. And also, always go around and measure all, around, all the way around and see that you're getting a consistent reading. You don't want this thing to be pyramid shaped. So this is pretty good, but I need to take a little bit more off. That's enough of a difference where I'm going to give it a try now. Just a bit more, but it's getting really close. Okay, so now that, that's really good. Basically what I'm looking for is, of course, the absence of play, which we had before. But now, if, it, if I just, just tighten it very lightly, I can feel that it's spinning very freely. You can just center that tube up a little bit better. And as I tighten the bearing closer to the specification, which is about 32 foot-pounds. Now I'm feeling just a little bit more resistance than when I just had it just snug. So that means that the bearing has a slight amount of preload to it. And this should be good. It's still spinning real freely, but I can feel just a little bit more resistance than when the, when the nuts just, just snug. And that's pretty much what we're looking for. So now we just need to take them back apart, clean the bearings, so we, in case we got any grit in the rollers or anything like that, real thoroughly, and then re-grease them and put the wheel back together, and put, the, put the wheel on the bike. So here's a, 
a little bit more graphical demonstration of, of what exactly, how exactly these tapered bearings work and, and what's going on with this, all this adjustment stuff. So you have to imagine that the outer bearing races are in a fixed location. They're pressed into the hub of the wheel. So that's a, that's a, a, a definite fact where they're, where they're located. So now, and so these are fitting inside of those bearing cups. Now just imagine there's a spacer here. If I make the spacer a little bit larger, it pushes the bearing out and that makes it loose in the cups. If I have a, you have a smaller spacer, then these come draw together. And, and so the trick is really to get the spacer just right so that the bearings are seated in there. There's no play. There's a little bit of tension on these rollers and, and that's basically what we're trying to do. I hope that helps those of you who don't understand or didn't know really what's going on with tapered bearings. It's the same with steering head bearings, any type of tapered bearing like that. That's essentially what we're after is that little bit of preload and no play. Just gonna clean these up and um, blow these out with a little bit of air now, get that, all that debris out of there. Now, one little bit of advice on, on these bearings is don't do this, what I'm going to do right now. Don't, don't, don't spin them like that. It makes a cool noise and everything, and it kind of looks neat, but the f reality is, is it could come apart, and you've got all these projectiles going anywhere, so it's just not a good idea. And you just kind of rotate the bearings with your finger and blow air through there. It's the safest way to clean these bearings. Okay, always use a good quality wheel bearing grease on these bearings. Um, in this case, we're using this Liquid Molly LM50. We've covered, we've covered this, the packing by hand uh, on a few other videos we've done, so sorry to repeat all that, but I actually, I'm gonna do it this way because my bearing packer um, with this wheel bearing grease in it, it is in my shop at home. I'm doing some other work there. So I forgot to bring it, but that's okay. We just do it the old fashioned way. And, oops. So you just basically put a suitable amount of grease in the palm of your hand. I recommend wearing a glove. And then take the bearing and just sort of press around until you see the grease coming through. See how that great grease is coming through the top there. There we go, that's pretty well done there. And then just some on the outside as well. And just set that right inside in there. That'll be a good spot for it for right now. And do the other one. Now I'm just going to take these caps and clean them out and we're going to go ahead and put new seals in too. So these center pieces, they just push right out like that. It's the same bearing driver I used before to put the bearings in. I'm just going to turn it around to get the small end on there. And these seals will just pop right out like that. Now oh, these are a little bit grimy. I'm just going to go, go to the solvent tank real quick and knock that stuff off. Okay, that's, that's much better. I've got all that tar off of there. They look pretty good actually. Okay, new seals. I 
Okay, so these are the seals to go in this type of hub, and there's there are some different variations on that. So these may not be the ones that fit in the bike that you're working on, but you'll notice there's a little bit of a raised lip on there. So I'm not just gonna use something like that bearing driver to put it in, but rather something that can straddle around there. I'm gonna find a socket that is a, a suitable size and drive these seals in. So this 27 actually works real nice, just fits right around onto the metal part of the seal. Cool. Clean these spacers off, get the old grease off of there, and then just gonna take a little bit of this excess grease and put a little smear on the inside of the seal. And then push the bushing in from the inside, just like that. Now I can go ahead and put this one on. And using the pin wrench, tighten it down. I'm just going to flip it around. And throw a little bit of grease in there, just for good measure, because there's going to be the, the grease will heat up and it'll, it'll flow a little bit. So having a little extra in there is not, not a bad idea. All right, so now we can put in the spacer sleeve. Actually, to get everything lined up right, you can stick the axle back in from the other side. And then introduce the spacer sleeve and the shim, it doesn't matter which side the shim goes on, one way or the other. I can put that other bearing on. Get all this extra grease off of there. And finally tighten this with the, with the pin wrench. All right, that's just about ready to put on. Now we gotta put the new brake disc in, in place. Of course, you want to mount the brake disc on the correct side. Uh, you could, could have marked it, but the tire is directional. I put it on correctly, I'm quite sure. And so that's direction of rotation here. And so it's the left side. That's where the disc is going to go. And then there's this shim on the back side. I'm going to use some new nylocks. Not only because the old ones look pretty bad, but they should always be replaced, I think. And of course, anything to do with brakes is a safety issue. So it never hurts to throw a new set of nuts on there. So the nuts go on the disc side, and if you have a dual disc, then that rule won't apply. So you can always just remember that the nuts are on the left side, and that's the way it is on pretty much every model that I'm aware of. The axle can be, of course, removed at this point. Just had it in there to make sure everything lines up for easier installation later. Okay, just snug for right now and then torque to 22 newton meters on this model, but always refer to your manual when it comes to torque specs. Don't take my word for it. All right, the wheel's ready to put back on. Let's take a little inventory of what we're going to put on the bike now. Brake master cylinder, along with the um, 
brake light switch, so I'll have to put that on. Okay, that's good to go. And the caliper, might as well put the brake pads in right at this point. So a couple new bits. We've got this clip here, which we'll get to in a second. ring and some brake, new brake pads. Okay, so looking at the brake pads, you can see that one of them has these little raised edges on there. That one's going to go on this side and the other one on the other side. You also notice that the brake pads on this model are kind of tapered, and that's absolutely normal. That's the way they're supposed to be. So this O-ring, we just took out of the package, uh, is actually supplied with the brake pads. Okay, that's pretty cool. I wasn't sure about that, but see, it's already on there. Very cool. So the O-ring, it it's serves to keep the uh, brake pad located and secure, so it doesn't rattle around goes on like that. Yeah, then you put this, the uh, other brake pad in like that and just lay the pin or the, um, lay the clip on like so and just press it into place, snaps in. And so that sort of holds the pads in place. And of course the, um, the uh, piston is all the way pushed in, so fit perfectly right over the disc, no problem. So that's about it. Then we've got the steering damper bits here. And um, yeah, let's uh, move over to the bike and start bolting some of this stuff on.